Hello everyone. Hope you guys are doing really great. Today we are going to further augment the discussion on homogeneous transformation. Remember last time we observed that in a transformation, rotation is one major part of it. So why not further explore that? Why not for multi-body systems compose rotations together? Why not decompose a rotation into individual elements? Why not parameterize it? So these are going to be a few questions that we will ask and further explore. So let's start it. As we generally recap what we did last time, so quickly you can remember that homogeneous transformation was defined to be having a four by four matrix. So this was a matrix and especially this matrix contained position and rotation in it. Now, when you have the position indicated that was defined like a vector in there, a three by one vector corresponding to position. And then there was a rotation which was having a three by three structure. So this was three by three, the rotation matrix. Now on top of that, we were interested in finding out uh, the homogeneous transformation corresponding to some frame of reference. So frame of reference was important. And in that case, we had two possibilities. One, what we call fixed frame, and the other, which is the moving frame or body attached frame. So in that context, we can recall that we said that the homogeneous transformation of the first frame with respect to zeroth frame was going to contain rotation of the first frame with respect to zeroth frame and translation of the first frame with respect to zeroth frame. And then we said that in this homogeneous transformation, you have a vector of three zeros and the last element is going to be one. So in that sense, it contains a specific structure and that was what we did last time. Now, on top of that, we were interested in finding out what happens with the position. And in that, I can make you recall that position of a point P was discussed. And this point P can be on a rigid body or it can be in a, in a free space. So that is going to be located corresponding to certain frame of reference. So if you have uh, one frame like X naught and Y naught to be there, so that may locate the point P using a vector or using the coordinates that we discussed last time. And similarly, you may have some other frame somewhere displaced, but that may also be important frame, just like X1 and Y1 we introduced last time. And that may also be used to locate the same point P but now this vector is going to be different than the V1 vector initially drawn. So for that reason, we were conscious that this point P is going to have the coordinates, all right, in 2D or 3D case like X, Y, and Z coordinates, but these coordinates are going to be with respect to some frame of reference. All right, and then we moved on to defining the rotations. That was the other part in the homogeneous transformation. So rotations were elaborated uh, initially in a 2D case where you had the fixed frame like this, X naught and Y naught. And then you had a rotated frame like this. You have X1 and Y1 rotated by theta. So in that case, we were eventually successful in finding out how these uh, two by two matrices are going to be structured. And that was then further uh, elaborated to contain the, uh, the cosines and sine of thetas in them. So this was something like cos of theta, this was minus sine of theta, this was sine of theta, and this was cos of theta. Now then we moved on to a 3D case. And in that case, we observed that the rotation of the first frame with respect to zeroth frame was having a three by three structure. 
And this three by three structure was specially designed in a sense that it contained three vectors corresponding to, to the three axes. This was X1 rotated with respect to frame zero. And similarly, this was corresponding to Y1 and this was corresponding to Z1. So these vectors were containing all those dot products in them. For example, over here you had X1 dot X0 and so on and so forth. So which was indicating that how the X1 is oriented with respect to frame zero and all that. So we found out that. But interestingly, when we observed the properties of these rotation matrices, these turned out to be special orthogonal matrices. And we know that special orthogonal matrices are going to contain certain properties which are going to be very helpful. Take, for example, this property that R inverse is equal to R transpose. So we know that taking a transpose of a matrix is much more easier than taking the inverse of it because you know that for inverse you have to take the adjoint of a matrix and then you have to divide it with the determinant of it which takes some time and similarly you can see that it contains certain properties corresponding to determinant being equal to one the columns and the rows which are going to be mutually orthogonal by design because these are the Cartesian frames that we are uh, that we are exploring and then also each column and therefore the row of this rotation matrix turns out to be a unit vector. So with this realization that these rotation matrices are going to have certain properties which are going to be very helpful in further finding out how the frames are transformed in uh, structuring these homogeneous transformations. So we said that we are going to use them. So what we are going to do today we're going to further explore rotations. And initially we will try to answer this question that can we compose multiple rotations together? Can we find one resultant rotation which accounts for multiple rotations in it? So let's try to answer this question. Remember last time we observed one expression that was something like this, that the position of point P in the not moving frame was equal to rotation of the first frame with respect to not moving frame times location of the same point P in the body attached frame. So this was only rotation case. We are not yet considering the translation, but we will consider that later on. Now, if I'm going to ask you to consider this as a first rotation and you have another rotation, that is something like P1 is equal to rotation of the second frame with respect to first frame times position of the same point P, but now with respect to the second frame. So in that case, you have two rotations, one over here, then the second one. Now, obviously you can see that, that this P1 over here can be replaced with the expression for P1 over there. So this would mean that P0 is equal to R10 times P1, which is R21 times P2. Now with this realization that you have this, like two rotations multiplied together, I can say that this is going to be equal to rotation of the second frame with respect to not moving frame or fixed frame to be equal to R10 times R21. So this is a very good expression to have. This expression indicates that you can compose rotations together. So uh, we are going to further explore later on, but at this particular stage, this seems quite simple and straightforward arrangement that you have the two rotation matrices, uh, you are going to combine them together, and this is going to give you one resultant rotation, uh, which will retain the properties of the special orthogonality as well. 
but there is a little issue in that. And that is that the rotations can be composed in different ways. For example, you can have the very first rotation happening like this, that the rotation is happening about the y-axis by a value phi. And then you can have the second rotation added in this fashion that whatever is the current or the new z-axis, which is z1, the second rotation is happening about that by a value theta. And you are interested in finding out what is going to be the combined effect of these rotations together. But the second rotation can be composed in different ways, and that is exhibited like over here. You have the first rotation happening in a similar fashion. That was in the first case as well. But the second rotation can be defined with respect to fixed frame, which was Z0 frame. Not the Z1 frame, but the fixed frame. So although it is a rotation happening about Z axis, but this Z axis itself is Z0, not the Z1 axis, which is the recent axis. So in that particular case, obviously you can see that the result is going to be different in both of these cases. And that makes these two like two different cases. The first case in the first row is defined as the current frame of reference methodology. And the second row corresponds to fixed frame of reference methodology. Now, the result is going to be different, and that is what we're going to further explore in this subsequent slide. Now, I can readily identify that this first rotation is rotation about y-axis by a value phi, and this corresponds to rotation about z-axis by a value theta. So I can write down the expressions that we derived for the basic rotation transformations earlier. And this was something like 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then you had cos of phi. Here you had sine of phi, if I'm not mistaken. This was, I suppose, minus sine of phi. And this was cos of phi. And then you can write down the rotation matrix corresponding to the z that we derived as well. So this was 0, 0, 1, and this was the way we, we defined over there in order to memorize that. So this was cos of theta, this was minus sine of theta, this was sine of theta, and this was cos of theta. So when you multiply the two matrices together, you can find out the resultant matrix, and that is quite simply structured. Like you have cos of phi, cos of theta over here, then you have cos of phi sine of theta, and then you have uh, over here sine of phi, I suppose, yes. And then you have sine of theta over here, you have cos of theta over here, you have zero, and then you have minus sine of phi cos of theta, and then you have sine of phi, sine of theta, and then you have cos of phi. So this is your resultant matrix. Which is based on the composition of two rotations, the first one being rotation about y-axis by a value phi, second being rotation about z-axis, and you must realize that this z-axis is the current z-axis. So that's why this definition over here must always be in your forefront. And I must, because it is that important that I must highlight it, that this approach is called 
a composition of rotation using current frame of reference methodology. Now see what is happening over here. The very first rotation is obviously in a similar fashion rotation about y-axis by a value phi. But the second rotation is rotation about z-axis by a value theta, obviously. But this z is fixed z-axis. That's why this fixed frame of reference methodology is different from the current frame of reference methodology that we defined earlier. So now, what is going to happen? Because if you observe what, is hap what has happened over here, that after rotating about y-axis, your current frame is parked over here, x1, y1 is coincided co coincident with the y0, and then you have z1 axis over here. But now the next rotation is happening about some axis that this current frame is not in, in line with. So you have to do what? So I would suggest that go back to Z0 frame initially. So that would be something like asking your rotation to happen over here, like R, Y, Phi, and then asking it to reverse R, Y with minus Phi over here. So once it has reversed, now you are going to be once again in line with the Z0 axis, and now you can have the rotation implemented corresponding to the Z0, which is the fixed Z axis by value phi. So you can do that. Now that I would write down like a rotation of about Z with a value theta in it. So that is accomplished. But now once you have done that, you need to compensate for this rotation that you had earlier done. So for that reason, I'll ask you to consider reversing it. And that would be having a rotation about y-axis by value phi added in it. So when we, when we do that, you can readily observe that this rotation phi by value phi and then reversing it is equal to r r inverse which is actually equal to identity matrix so that would mean that the remaining expression is going to be r z theta times r y phi and that is equal to resultant rotation Or if I may say that, it is equal to rotation of the second frame with respect to the zeroth frame. So this is the expression corresponding to the fixed frame of reference methodology of composing rotations together. So in that particular sense, there is obviously going to be a difference between the two approaches. One, when you consider that your your robot your robot or any frame associated with that is is having multiple rotations, but with respect to fixed frame of reference methodology, then you need to do what? You need to reverse the order of rotations as we have done over here. The second rotation, which was corresponding to Z first, and then the first rotation, which was corresponding to Y axis. So you have reversed the order of rotations over here. One little aspect that I need to further emphasize is that the order of matrix multiplication is going to be important. So you must remember that if there are two matrices A and B multiplied in this order, that would not be equal to B multiplied with A. So you have to keep this in your mind as well. So this example that is being shown over here is a further illustration of the same concept. So in this case, you can see that you have a body over here in the first row, 
which is rotated about Z axis by 90 degrees and the resulting orientation would be this. And now if you rotate about the current Y axis, then the orientation of the body would be after 90 degrees rotation would be this. Now if you compare by reversing the order of rotation, Y rotation first followed by the Z rotation, then you can see that the same body starting from the same orientation turns out to be differently oriented after the second rotation. So that is an important aspect to be, to be uh, kept in mind uh, because that's why uh, you are going to try to multiply the homogeneous transformations with each other as well. So while composing rotations together, you have to multiply the matrices, but the order of matrix multiplication would be important aspect to be considered. Another important aspect to be considered is that the second rotation in this example is happening with respect to the current frame of reference. So we will co compare this result with the fixed frame of reference methodology as well, once again. Now consider the same example, but with a little twist, is that the second rotation is happening now with respect to fixed frame Y and fixed frame Z. So second rotation is with respect to fixed frame of reference. Now, in that particular scenario, you can readily observe that body starts from the same initial orientation. So now the first rotation is happening about Z axis and the second rotation is happening about the fixed Y axis, which was this. So if you rotate this body by 90 degrees, this is going to be the final orientation of it. Keep this in your mind. We are going to compare it with the results of the current frame of reference methodology. Now, further, you can also see in the second row that when body starts from the same orientation, but now the order of multiplication is reversed, that you have Y first and Z later, then the final orientation is this. So I'm going to compare the reversed order orientation over here with the normal order orientation of the current frame of reference methodology. Now I'm going to bring forward the first example corresponding to current frame of reference methodology over here. You can see that the body starts from this orientation. This is the same example that we have seen earlier. So after rotating about Z axis and then rotating about the current Y axis, the current Y axis once again about 90 degrees, then the final orientation is this. But now if you compare it with the fixed frame of reference arrangement, starting from the same starting orientation, but now the order is reversed Y first and then Z later, which is obviously the reverse order of this multiplication. So in that particular scenario, the body turns out to be in the same orientation as of the current frame of reference methodology. So in order to further highlight that, this is going to be when two rotations with current frame of reference method are executed. So that would mean that the rotation of the final rotation of the second frame with respect to zeroth frame is equal to R Z times R Y. And this is when you have Are the, two, the two rotations are happening with fixed
frame of reference method and that would mean that you are going to have the order reversed r20 would be r y first in rz later so in that particular case this would be equal to this would be equal to this orientation when you reverse the order of multiplication so the answer to this question is yes but we must be aware of the order of multiplication let's ask another question can we find parameters of a rotation matrix possibly we can but how are we going to do that? Let's explore it. Now, I'm going to write one rotation matrix in kind of a generic form. Since these are three by three sized matrices, you can have these elements to be numbered like R11, R12, R13 which corresponds to the first row and the three columns. And then you have R21, R22, R23, and similarly, R31, R32, R33. Now, obviously, you can see that these are nine unknowns. Which would require generally nine equations so that's the question how can we kind of find those unknown parameters in rotation matrices so that's the question that we need to answer so from where we should start i would suggest that possibly we can look into the properties of a rotation matrix so that's the starting point look into the properties of rotation matrices and remember rotation matrix matrices belong to special orthogonal class. So since we know that rotation matrices are going to have certain properties, what is going to be the starting property which is going to greatly help us out? So I can think of that and possibly I can explore this property that columns and therefore rows are going to have unit magnitude. Now, mathematically, this would be kind of written in this form that summation of Rij squared, when you have I over here, is going to be equal to 1. And this is going to be for J to belong to because it is 3 by 3 sized matrices 1, 2, and 3. So I can further explore that, that uh, let, let it be like for j to be equal to 1 i can see that uh, this expression is going to be summation on i when you have r i 1 squared so this is going to be equal to r 1 1 squared plus r 2 1 squared plus r 3 1 squared and that obviously is going to be equal to 1 so this is one of the equations then for j to be equal to 2, I can rewrite this expression, r i 2 squared. So this is going to be r 1 2 squared plus r 2 2 squared plus r 3 2 squared. And that would also be equal to 1. And similarly for j, the last value possible is 3. And for that, this is going to be r i 3 squared summation of that and that is going to be r 1 3 squared 
plus r two three squared plus r three three squared to be equal to one. And that obviously you can see. Let me use a different color over here. Uh, this corresponds to the first column, and this corresponds to second column because j to be equal to two, and this corresponds to the third column. Now the magnitude of each columns in this case are going to be equal to one. So in that particular scenario. Uh, this property is going to give us three equations and for that matter six remaining equations are needed still needed so let's explore that as well now the second property from these special orthogonal matrices that I can explore can be like, uh, yeah, possibly columns and rows since these are mutually orthogonal. I can explore that as well. By design of Cartesian, matri Cartesian frames, this is obvious, but in order to mathematically realize it, this would be giving us some sort of this expression that you have r1 i multiplied with or dot produced with r1 j and then you add that with r2 i dot produced with r2 j then you have the scalar product between r3 i r3 j to be equal to zero because of orthogonality and for that the condition is the j should not be equal to i in these expressions so i can further explore that and that would mean that for example for first combination like for i to be equal to one uh, j can be two so i can explore that that would mean that r one one times r 1 2 plus r 2 1 times r 2 2 and then you have added with that r 3 1 times r 3 2 should be equal to 0 and what does that mean that means that in 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 a, in a matrix you have uh, you have columns two columns being compared in this particular case i and j are going to correspond to that now with this realization that you have this as one of the expressions you can use that you can have another combination of i and j for i to be equal to 2 for example you can try j to be equal to 3 and the same expression is going to be rewritten like r1 2 r1 3 multiplied together and then you have r2 2 r2 2, 3 and then you have r3 2 times r 3 3 to be equal to 0 and then you can try the last combination for i to be equal to 3 the j can be equal to 1 and that would mean that you have r 1 3 times r 1 1 plus r 2 3 times r 2 1 plus r 3 3 times r 3 1 to be equal to 0 so that would mean that you can make use of the scalar product between mutually orthogonal axes and that would be obviously equal to zero and this is going to give us three more equations that would mean that three equations are still needed now you can see in these cases in these two cases that we have uh, mentioned over here we have explored the two properties of special orthogonal matrices uh, and uh, since rotation matrices are special orthogonal obviously we can use these 
constraint equations uh, to help us out to find those uh, those many equations which are needed to be uh, uh, needed to be solving uh, the, the nine unknown parameters in a in a general rotation matrix. Now the question is that what about those remaining three equations? How are we are going to find out those? Uh, possibly, if we can compose rotations together, can we decompose one rotation into multiple rotations or not? Yes, we can, but how are we going to do that? Let's see. For this purpose, possibly we can resort to classical mechanics, and in that, Euler angle representation can be used. So, if I can briefly introduce it, the very first angle is called phi, which is about the z axis. You can see that rotation happening about z axis over here. The next angle in the Euler angles is theta, which is about the current y axis. So once the axis was rotated, the current y axis was used as a reference to take the other rotation about that by theta radians. And the third one is an angle what we call psi angle, and that is about the current z axis again. Now, since I'm emphasizing the word current in there, it would mean that I'm going to use a current frame of reference methodology to compose these three rotations together. I can say that one rotation which is rotation of the first frame with respect to zeroth frame can be decomposed into these three rotations. The very first one is rotation about z axis by value phi. And then the second one in the same order because it is the current frame of reference methodology. The second one corresponds to rotation about y axis by value theta. And the third one is a rotation about the current z axis by value psi radians. So this is z comma psi. So now I can make you recall that we have these matrices together uh, available. Uh, this matrix rotation about z is already known. All we have to do is to plug in phi in there we have the knowledge of rotation about y-axis and we are going to plug in theta in there and we have the rotation about z-axis matrix already available in the basic rotation transformations we have to plug in with psi as angular displacement in that and then if we can multiply these rotation matrices together we can find one matrix or alternatively we can say that we can have a matrix available with us and we can decompose it using these three Euler angles. And if we can do that over here quickly, that would be like R10, which is equal to or decomposed into three rotation matrices, Rz by value phi. Then you have Ry by theta, and then you have Rz by psi radians. Now, I can plug in these matrices over there, and that would be equal to a matrix quickly written like cos of phi, then you have minus sine of phi, then you have zero, then you have sine of phi, then you have cos of phi, and then you have zero, and then you have zero, zero, one over there. The second one is rotation about y, so that, that was memorized in this fashion and then you have cos of theta you have sine of theta you have minus sine of theta over here and then you have cos of theta over here and then you had the rotation about z already written down but now you have to change phi with psi and that would be cos of psi minus 
sine of psi and then you have zero you have uh, sine of psi and then you have cos of psi and then you have zero then you have zero zero one so that would be equal to the rotation matrix that we have written already in a generic form so that was r11 r12 r13 and so on and so forth now once you multiply these rotation matrices on the right hand side you are going to find a big matrix and that big matrix is going to be somewhat overwhelming so i'm finding it difficult to write myself as well so i'll uh, i'll paste the the resultant matrix over here but you are going to have uh, a three by three matrix as a result of these uh, uh, individual matrices multiplied together using the Euler angles. Now, if I paste this matrix from your book, this would be this matrix. Now, obviously you can see that this is seemingly a big matrix which involves all the Euler angles, but we can uh, in order to make comparison, we can start from the simplest term available in this whole matrix. And that is available over here, cos of theta. That cos of theta, when compared with the matrix on the other side, is equal to R33. So I can write that one down. That R33, for that matter, is equal to cos of theta. And I can start from there. So let's find out those three unknown equations using Euler angles uh, starting from this thread that we have found that r33 is equal to cos of theta let's try to find out that now comparing this r33 with cos of theta term over there so i can say that cos of theta is equal to r33 which would mean that theta is equal to cos inverse of r33 but when we're going to use the the this expression to find out uh, one equation for theta uh, we may not get all the possible solutions encapsulated in it so we have to find out uh, a tan inverse expression that is going to be greatly helping us out to to arrest the other possible possible solution so for that reason i would say that if rather than having this written over here i'll erase that and i'll say that i'll take one step more i'll say that if cos of theta is r33 sine of theta which is equal to 1 minus cos square of theta under root that would be my scenario so in that particular case i can i can rewrite that that this is going to be 1 minus r33 squared under root so when you have these two expressions available with you you can now write down the expression for tan of theta which is equal to sine of theta over cos of theta so once you have that you can obviously write down these expressions this is going to be indicating that theta is equal to tan inverse of sine of theta which is actually plus minus square root of 1 minus r33 squared over cos of theta which actually is r33 so this is a better expression For the theta so this is one more equation we still have to find out two more equations as well so we had six equations coming in from the constraint equations and seventh from this expression by comparing uh, the matrix that we have just computed using the Euler angle representation uh, we still have to find out the two more equations for that 
Now I'm going to observe something like this column, the remaining term, terms in this column. So let's try to manipulate those. So if I say that, I'm going to take the, uh, the, the second term over here, which is sine of phi. sine of phi multiplied with sine of theta and divide it with the first term in that column which is cos of phi then you have sine of theta so in that particular sense i can cancel sine of theta from both of these expressions and that would be equal to sine of phi over cos of phi but actually this expression is tan of phi expression now, on the other side, where you have, let me use the same color for this boxing, and you have these two terms in the general rotation matrix. So I can write those one down over here as well. So this is going to be equal to R23 divided by R13. And that would mean that you have phi expression to be equal to tan inverse of r23 over r13 so this is second equation that we have found by observing the last column in in this comparison so this gives us one more equation let's try to do the same stuff for the last row as well let me use a different color now so just observe what is happening in these two terms over here so i can suspect that i can i can cancel this sine of theta and sine of theta by taking the ratio of the two so in that particular scenario i can write down like this that you have let's say it is sine of theta times sine of psi divided by minus sine of theta times cos of psi this ratio this is going to be because sine of theta can be cancelled from numerator and denominator uh, you are going to have as a result of that uh, minus sine of psi over cos of psi and that actually is equal to minus tan of psi and that when compared with the other side on the left hand side with these terms you can obviously see that this is going to be equal to r uh, 3 2 over r31 with a, with a negative sign and that would mean that you have psi expression now computed which is equal to tan inverse of r32 over minus r31 so this is going to be the third and the last remaining expression that we wanted to have so using the six constraint equations and three equations over here this this and this we can have the nine unknowns accounted for in the rotation matrices we can do a similar exercise using roll pitch and yaw notation in order to parameterize the rotations but that you must try yourself we will do one more exercise on that and that would be corresponding to axis angle representation uh, this is a more generic representation scheme we will try to explore that next time and we will also try to conclude all the discussion that we have had of the homogeneous transformations but coming back to the work done today i can be confident now that you now know how 
the composition of rotations can be accomplished using current frame of reference methodology or fixed frame of reference methodology. And you also know that if we can compose rotations together, we can decompose one rotation matrix into constituent components. For example, we have done in much more detail corresponding to Euler angle representation. We will further augment that discussion with another uh, representation scheme later on, but we now feel confident that we can do that. And also in order to kind of find the parameters of a generic rotation matrix, we now know that we are going to exploit the uh, constraint equations or the properties of the special orthogonal class of matrices and that we have done in much more detail today. So uh, I'm confident that we have done our part for this particular uh, component of the lecture, uh, but in the next time, uh, we are going to complete all the uh, all the things together and conclude the discussion on homogeneous transformations. So until that time, bye bye.